Hello, dear colleagues. We welcome you to the second biopsy conference for the countries Kosovo, Albania, Northern Macedonia, and um, any other countries which are involved in this biopsy conference and which is organized by Professor Godanzi. And I'd like to thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you through the internet and um, we are happy to give you a presentation but also discuss the cases with you this evening. Uh, together with me I have on my left side Dr. Miftari who is a native of Kosovo and uh, who is really interesting to stay in contact with you and uh, we've been in Kosovo many times together with Dr. Beinler who is on the far right of me over the past years and we think uh, we will have a good cooperation and a good spirit uh, working together in the future. But the most important person, of course, is Professor Walter, our nephropathologist over the past 40 plus years or so, uh, who is uh, really um, an expert in nephropathology from the beginning of his training up to now. He's now a senior professor at the Department of Pathology uh, in the uh, Institute of Pathology uh, with the head of Professor Schirmacher, who is probably also well known to some of you um, in uh, Pristina, I believe. Uh, for this evening, we have two cases um, out of the field of uh, nephrotic proteinuria. Uh, you stay tuned um, what cases we found for you, and we'll have a presentation, a clinical case presentation, the nephropathology as well as the clinical course and a few slides on treatment, on the current treatment of these diseases. Before going into further detail, I'd like to transfer now to, an, to my good friend, to my brother Neshat, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, with him I traveled many times together with Jörg Beimler to the Kosovo and uh, with a real good friend and a colleague and a collaborator here in Germany. Neshat, please. Yeah, dear Professor, thank you very much, dear Professor Walter, dear Jörg. It's uh, my pleasure to say hello for the second uh, conference of the pathology. I want to say some words in Albanian because most of colleagues are from, from, from Kosovo and Albania, but we have colleagues from, from Macedonia, like said, Professor Sayan, from Croatia, Turkey. I think, we, I hope we have a number, lot of number of colleagues, and I'm really very glad that Professor Walter will teach us again on nephropathology. Pro colleague to the room, you push this presentation session the conference in the to nephropathology, which is organized by the Clinic in the of Pathology, the me Clinic in the of Nephrology in Kosovo, and the Royal Dr. Vyotsa Godonsin, President of the Nephrology, which is a project that is a project that is a project that is a project that is a Fund fundit me arri qëllë në Kosovë me realizu shpeti bioksinë e veshkës. Êshtë fatë që tani edhe në, edhe në klinikën e patologjisë kemi një, një partë një shumë të një që, është, që, që, është, që ka shpejt gati shumë i shumë të madhe me ndihmu procesin e në patologjisë. Êshtë natërisht, është me të vërtet dhe që ka shumë e madhe që prosur Walter një rëpë patologu më të mirë në Evropë. Êshtë me, me shumë zemër i gati shumë që gjithdo herë nga mësoj rastet të reja të nef Sinceresht, për mu vetëm bashk me, me këtë uh, patologjin mund me qenë nefrolog komplet. Shtë që uh, kam knasit të madhe, përshëndes dhe kolegë nga Shqipëria, me ndojshë edhe i pjesë e tyre, me sigur i marim pjesë, um, edhe e shpërës të gjitha gemi një të pasnitet mirë. Fëndjetë shumë, ju roj së të mirë. Pozdravë i kolegis Hrvatske, i drugi zemalas uh, Balkana, shto danas u gjovë i drugë konferences me gjuhë. Uh, Unë se të Hadebek i, i Prishtine, mislim da imamo ve, veoma uh, interesantni uh, uh, um, patolični stvari danas i želim se nabole. Thank you, Nezhat. Um, I'd like to turn over now to Professor Walter. Before Professor Walter is standing, we'd like to encourage you to ask questions and please use the uh, chat uh, opportunity. We can read it from here and we can uh, transfer the question, of course, to the panel as well to the audience, and we'll try to answer everything with the best of our knowledge. So let's start now with um, an overview on histopathology and kidney biopsies, which was 
Um, the question from you, and you would like to hear a few more details on the techniques, uh, how to uh, do a proper biopsy reading, and with that I'll turn over to Rüdiger Garata. Thank you, Martin and Nashat, uh, dear participants. It was a particular wish to uh, present some basics concerning renal biopsy and nephropathology, and I will try to give you a short overview how a renal biopsy has to be done and how um, it is handled. First of all, the diagnostic and prognostic value of a renal biopsy is dependent on an adequate sample or adequate samples that you do. Furthermore, it is important that these samples are optimally processed, that there is a good diagnosis and interpretation, and what is the most important is an interdisciplinary communication between the pathologist and the nephrologists. What, what do we need or what do we expect from a renal biopsy? First of all, we recommend to do two cores or to give two cores uh, at least one centimeter long uh, to the pathologist. Why that? Because the need for an adequate diagnosis, an optimum of 10 to 15 clomoli. Well, this is, in a majority of patients, important. A minimum that is an internationally um, consensus 5 to 10 plumoli. Of course, when you have an amyloidosis and there is one clomolus full with amyloid and you have additionally uh, amyloid deposits in the vessel walls and or in the interstitium, a smaller biopsy can be, give an adequate diagnosis. A second important thing is when a urology do, does a wedge biopsy, you should always uh, do additionally a needle biopsy. Why that? Because urologists uh, cut on the surface of the kidney and you have the alter cortex. In older patients, there we, in this region we have always severe, more or less severe vascular uh, changes, which are in most cases not representative of the whole kidney. When you have done the biopsy, you have to control, because in most instances, you look for a clomolar process, you have to control these biopsies under a stereo microscope, or if th this is not present, uh, you can use a loop control, uh, for example, um, uh, as have uh, uh, surgeons. Well, two cores are an optimum. This is possible, not in all cases. And uh, nevertheless, we recommend to take 15 gauge needles and not 18 gauge needles because you lose a lot of clomoli and a lot of value of the renal biopsy. This shows you two samples. On the right, a 12 gauge biopsy. Uh, on the left, a 12 gauge biopsy. And on the right, a 18 gauge biopsy. You see the diameter is less than a half of this representative biopsy. Well, the basic methods are like microscopy. This is still the most important method, the most important technique in reading renal biopsy. You have always to do immunohistology because 
the kidney, you know that, is a, an organ which is predisposed to immune complex diseases, to immunologic processes, and therefore you need the immunostrology. Electronos, electron microscopy should be done whenever you can do that. In fact, in about 70 to 80 percent in our department, we do electron microscopy. It's not necessary, for example, in cases with an acute interstitial nephritis where you have normal comoli. It's not always necessary in a typical IgA nephropathy, for example. But we come later to that point. There are several disorders which need electron microscopy. You can add additional, in most instances, scientific techniques as immune EM, PCR, intrahyperization, microarray, and so on, that is not important for the moment. Well, when you have a renal biopsy, and this biopsy is embedded, you have to do serial sections. This is important because there are many conditions in the kidney which are focal. And so you have to cut uh, at least um, 10 to 12 sections from each biopsy for light microscopy. The standard stains are hematoxylineosin, PAS, a trichrome stain, and in most instances also a silver stain. You can add fungison for elastica um, uh, fibrils, Congorat stain when you suspect anomalidosis, cosa from cosa stain when you expect nephrocalcinosis. We have also our standard immunohistology. We use antibodies against IgA, IgG, IgM, C1Q, C3C, and fibrin. And for internal control, in most instances, also albumin. In some cases, additional antibodies have to be added for adequate diagnosis. Kappa and lambda light chain, when you suspect a kidney involvement in a monoclonal, monoclonal antibody, a monoclonal disease, amyloid A protein for the differentiation of amyloid deposits. In addition, we do pr 2 r one and THSD7A in cases of membranous nephropathy, exostosines 1 and 2 in cases with membranous lupus nephritis and DNA JB9 when we suspect a fibroclomalopathy. In transplant biopsies, in addition, we always use for each case C4D, which is important, for humoral rejection and uh, SV40 antigen antibodies uh, when you suspect polyuma virus infection. There are many optional antibodies and reactants that you can use for the evaluation of renal biopsies. Some are important, for example, matrix proteins or antibodies against viral antigens when you suspect a CMV or uh, EBV infection. This shows the basic stainings uh, that we use. Hematoxylin eosin is it a standard coloration in pathology in general. For the kidney, it's not so important to have an HE stain. It's good for the differentiation of uh, necrotic lesions, for example, in this case, uh, fibrinate necrosis in an artery, in the wall of an artery, in a necrotizing arteritis. More important is DPS stain, which stains extracellular matrix. As you can see here, this is a case of focal segmental glomerulosclerosis and the basement membranes. A trichrome stain, 
is useful for the differentiation of deposits that can already be seen on light microscopy. In this case, this is a, a lupus nephritis. In this case, these deposits are red, these deposits are reddish, and you can see that these are localized in the mesangium and along capillary loops, predominantly in some endothelial location. And in many cases, we also use a silver stain. This is also a case of a membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis, where you can see the typical double contouring appearance of the peripheral basement membranes, the tram track phenomenon. What? Tissue processing. There are two methods, and it depends on your lab which method you prefer. The conventional method or classic method, here you need separate tissue for light microscopy, immunohistology, and electron microscopy. Particularly in Germany, the so called triple method is generally used. For this method, the specimen or the specimens are completely fixed in buffered formalin. In the conventional method, you always fix a specimen in 4% buffered formalin. For immunohistochemistry, you use frozen sections with direct or indirect immunofluorescence, peroxidase methods, or alkaline phosphatase, anti antiphosphatase method. And for EM, small pieces from each specimen, from the, the end of each specimen, are fixed in 2% phos phosphate buffered glutaraldehyde. In the triple method, the specimens or the small pieces for AM are prepared in the pathology laboratory. Light and microscopy and immunohistology is done on paraffin embedded biopsy tissue. This shows you some examples. The classic immunofluorescence on the cryostate sections, in this case, that's IgA, and you can see the green deposits of IgA predominantly in the mesangium. Here we have another dye, Texas red, and this shows amyloid doses uh, with an antibody against amyloid A, a protein. You see the amyloid deposits in the vessel walls, in the vessel wall here, and also in the mesangium. This is an immunoperoxidase staining in the case of segmental glomerular sclerosis. This is IgM, and you see the positive reaction at the, at this, in this glomerulus. And the last example is an uh, alkaline phosphatase, antiphosphatase uh, reaction, where you see a linear staining of the basement membranes in a case of anti-clomolar basement glomerulonephritis. Well, the advantages and disadvantages for each method. The conventional method, which is widely used in the US, is a fast method, it is less expensive. You have a no loss or reduction of antigenicity because you use cryostate sections, and additional techniques are usually feasible. When light microscopy material is not uh, very good, you can reprocess the frozen material for light microscopy and even for EM. Optimal fixation for electron microscopy is in this uh, method the case because the specimens are fixed immediately in buffered glutaraldehyde. The disadvantage is you need a cryostat, you have to freeze the specimen, 
you have to do Christ detections and exact localization of the deposits is in some cases uh, difficult. And finally, you have to document um, the positive and negative results by photographs. The triple method is simple for the clinician because the whole tissue is fixed. Light microscopy in, on, and immunostology are done on, is performed on uh, serial sections and a automated immunohistochemistry chemistry is applicable when you uh, program your uh, automated. And finally, immunosustaining persist in contrast to the fluorescent dyes, uh, which lose their positivity within days or weeks. The disadvantages you have really for the kidney biopsies, an optimal and standard, standardized technique, you have to be aware of non-specific reactions with the dye, and some antibodies which are probably today not, is not so important, may not function on this fixed material. It's both time and labor intensive and is more expensive uh, because you have to use uh, different steps for the positivity or for the immunohistology. Well, electron microscopy should be done whenever possible. However, there are certainly some conditions where electron microscopy is absolutely necessary to do the exact diagnosis, particularly in hereditary chromopathies, Alport syndrome, and for example, thin basement membrane disease, where you have to do morphometry of the glomerular basement membranes um, on uh, EM. It is important for the differentiation of non amyloidotic fibrillary, fibrillary uh, glomerulonephritis or glomerulopathies, uh, for example, in fibrillary glomerulonephritis and immunotactoid glomerulonephritis. It is important in most cases for the differentiation of membranopolative glomerulonephritis and is particularly important also for the differentiation of the so-called C3 dominant glomerulonephritis. And finally, to evaluate the effacement of food processes in minimal change disease and in primary and secondary focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, in many cases differentiation is between these two forms of FSGS is only possible on electron microscopy. One or two examples. This shows a typical basement membrane in Alport syndrome with this irregularly uh, designed glomerular basement membrane and the basket wave pattern on the outside. Food processes are still intact in this case. This shows at higher magnification, a typical case of immunotactoid glomerulopathy if these microtubular structures uh, they have a diameter between 25 to 30 nanometers. This is an example of a so-called C3 dominant glomerulonephritis, a dense deposit disease and you see the osmophilic deposition or osmophilic coloration along the whole glomerular basement membrane. And finally, an example of a minimal change or nephrotic idiopathic syndrome with a almost normal glomerular basement membrane but a complete effacement of podocyte food processes. Well, 
When you have the material, when you have the sections, uh, when you have the immunostology, what has to be done? What in line microscopy become the number of glomeruli, we estimate cellularity and matrix, and uh, we mention sclerosis, either global, that means the whole glomerulus is sclerotic, segmental, or nodular, for example, in a diabetic nephropathy. It is important to count crestins, adhesions, and of course to mention necrosis. GBN thickness and appearance can already be estimated at the light microscopic level. And in many cases, with adequate light microscopic stainings, the presence and location of a deposit is possible. The second important compartment are tubules and interstitium. You may have a variety of lesions, for example, edema, fibrosis, cellular infiltration. You may look for intertubular casts and tubular cell injury, and particularly the extent of tubular atrophy has to be mentioned. Concerning the vessels, the vessel thickness, whether or not there is high lenosis of materials, sclerosis in arteries, inflammation, and of course, necrosis. On immunohistology, the pattern, composition, the localization, and the extent in, and intensity with a score, um, O to 3 or O to 4 scale has to be mentioned. Electron microscopy, cellularity, and extracellular matrix, of course, the extent, location, and structure of deposits, and in what is very important, GBN thickness and structure has uh, to be evaluated. Photocyte changes, endothelial alterations, and as well as tubular and vascular changes are also important when you have these structures in the electron microscopic material. How to report and how to do a diagnosis? First, and that is general consensus, we give you descriptive diagnosis. We describe what we see, but the interpretation of these biopsy findings should include clinical information and laboratory data. Optimum is when a final diagnosis is based on pathogenesis and etiology. Okay, etiology, that is difficult because we know in most cases not the eliciting event. Furthermore, we have to give some remarks on the severity. In many processes on the activity or chronicity, for example, in extracapillary chlamanophytes, we can give some information to the clinician to the clinician concerning prognosis and therapeutic um, response. We have in many uh, conditions a scoring or class uh, that we can use and we can uh, give recommendation recommendation for additional analyses, for example, genetics in some kidney disorders. Well, the Renal Pathology Society and the Mayo Clinic gave some rec recommendations in uh, 2016 how to report the diagnosis in a renal biopsy. And I give you an example. We have positive IgA deposits, we have uh, light microscopic changes, so we can do or we can do the diagnosis of IgA glomerulonephritis. The primary diagnosis is 
an immune complex glomerulonephritis with predominant IgA, a so called IgA nephropathy. On light microscopy, we have diffuse mesangial proliferation. So the description of morphology is diffuse mesangial proliferative glomerulonephritis. And in addition, we have in a few glomeruli segmentally sclerosing lesions. And that has to be mentioned because it's of prognostic uh, importance. In such cases, we use the Oxford score. In this case, we have mesangial proliferation, that is F1. We have no um, endocapillary hypercellularity, that is ENO, e EO. We have segmental sclerosis, S1. We have significant tubular atrophy exceeding more than 25%, that is T1, and we have no prosthetic lesions, that is CO. We have to mention the percentage or the number of uh, glomeruli with sclerosis, either segmental or global. When present, we have to mention the extent and the number of crescentic lesions. We have to estimate the degree of tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis in percent. And we have to create arterial and arterioma lesions. That is the complete information that you can give from a renal biopsy. So, is, are there any questions so far from the audience? So, first of all, thank you very much for this. No, I'm not ready. Uh, you're not ready so no. far? No. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> but there is, so, one, there is one person in the chat who knows you from Heidelberg, so maybe you can answer in the next few days to Dr. Zilo Sani, when I read correctly from the distance, who met you in 2008 in Heidelberg. <clears throat> okay. But you are free to ask questions using the chat. And uh, we are happy, and Professor Walter is happy to answer them. Any comments from the panel? Not ready, so Not maybe good. we proceed. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Können Sie mich wieder einschalten? So, it's not eins work. So, the second part will concern some basic morphological patterns, and I will give you some, um, I'll show you some pictures and give you some definitions um, for the evaluation of a renal biopsy. Let's start with a normal glomerulus. On the left side, you see a PES reaction. On the right side, a silver impregnation of a normal or two normal glomeruli. You see the glomerular basement membranes are thin and delicate on PES and silver staining. And the mesangium is very thin. And the normal number of mesangium cells, you have to count the nuclei, they represent the, mesangium, the number of mesangial cells, should not exceed two or three nuclei per peripheral mesangial area. Four nuclei are pathologic. This is a normal glomerular basement membranes with food processes regularly seen in between this slit membrane, and we have the fenestrated endothelial and here endothelial cells. This belongs already to the mesiatrum. This shows some proliferative forms of uh, glomerular disease. On the right side, you can see the hypercellularity of the glomerulus, and this hypercellularity is primarily due to an expansion of mesangial areas. You see here three 
or even more mesential nuclei, mesential cells. And there's a clear-cut increase in mesential matrix. So we would call this reaction a mesential proliferative glomerulophritis. Similarly, on the right side, uh, on the trichom stain, mesential expansion with an increase in nuclei and a greenish matrix. Such cases should be evaluated, of course, by immunohistology that can be an IgA glomerulophritis, a post-infectious glomerulophritis, a mesential proliferative lupus nephritis. So you need additional techniques and information. Another example of a so-called intracapillary that means that all is within the capillaries and the mesangium of an intracapillary uh, process in the glomerulus. This is a typical case of post-infectious glomerulophritis. You can see that the capillary lumina are not visible in many areas, and, that, uh, and these capillary lumina are filled with uh, inflammatory cells, meaning uh, neutrophils and monocytes. Such alterations you can see typically in post-infectious or post-steptococcal glomerulophritis. On the right side, another case of an intracapillary proliferative process process, um, not only the mesangium is widened, and there is an increase in mesangial cells, but also the peripheral capillaries, as you can see here, cannot be differentiated properly, and there are deposits predominantly here in subendothelial location. This is a case intracapillary process, a typical membranoproliferative or mesangial capillary glomerulonephritis. The extracapillary lesions, as you can see in extracapillary glomerulonephritis, are very important with respect to therapy and prognosis. On the left side, a segmental crescentic lesion, a purely cellular lesion with many cells. Most of these cells are properly proliferated capsular epithelial cells. On the right side, we have a circumferential cellular crescentic lesion, and the capillary lumina are compressed or collapsed. The red, the red material here, that is fibrin. We have here a fibrinoid necrotic lesion on the left side of these eclomolas. The definition of a crescent is two or more capsular proliferated capsular epithelial layers of capsular proliferated cells um, in Bowman's capsule, in Bowman's space. What happens with such a crescentic lesion? Cells disappear. Capsular epithelial cells and cells coming out from the vestigium produce extracellular matrix. The inflammatory cells disappear. We have here flattened cells, partly fibroblasts, and extracellular matrix. And the adjacent capillaries are scattered. 
we call this a fibrocellular crescentic lesion. And on the right side, because we have cells in the extracellular matrix, on the right side, the scarring um, of such an extra capillary lesion with mostly extracellular matrix and only few fibroblast-like cells within this area. Cellular and partly fibrocellular crescentic lesions are potentially reversible. Such a scarred lesion is irreversible. irreversible. Another important process in the glomerulus is the sclerosing process. This, for example, a completely obsolescent glomerulus, what we call global glomerulus sclerosis. This is a glomerulus with two segmental lesions in the upper and lower part of the glomerulus. You can see there are no capillary lumina, there are only a few cells and there's a lot of PS-positive extracellular matrix. Two another samples of glomerulus sclerosis, diabetic nephropathy. This represents a diffuse mesangial sclerosis where extracellular matrix is deposited, is, decree, is increased. There are only a few cells, a few nuclei within these extracellular matrix. And this is a typical nodular glomerular sclerosis, Kubelstein-Wilson's disease in advanced diabetic nephropathy. <coughs> Some examples of immunohistology. On the left side, the, the other picture, that is a typical coarsely granular positive reaction. And when I mention that this is C3C, then you can do the diagnosis or the probable diagnosis of post-infectious glomerulonephritis. But you have to differentiate from other C3 dominant glomerulonephritis and do electron microscopy. On the right side, a predominantly mesangial deposition of IgG. Well, that can be seen in several conditions, for example, in lupus nephritis, in uh, fibrillary glomerulonephritis, and other conditions. Also, in this case, in, at least when lupus is excluded, you have additional examinations with specific antibodies and electron microscopy. This is a typical case, IgG, of a membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis with IgE deposits here in subendothelial location, large deposits, and mesangial location. And this, the last picture is also IgG, a typical case of anti glomerular basement membrane disease in a patient with good pasture syndrome. Tubular findings are also important, and I'll show you some examples. On the left side, a patient with acute renal failure. In contrast to normal tubules, you see a dilatation of tubular lumina. You have a flattening of tubular epithelial cells, and at higher magnification, you would see that there is a loss of the brush border in these uh, tubular, proximal tubular epithelial cells. In addition, you have interstitial edema with a few inflammatory cells. Another example of tubular changes, osmotic nephrosis with complete microvascular transformation of proximal tubular epithelial cells. You have also to look not only for the tubules itself, but also what is within the lumina. Here, for example, you see some material, faintly PAS positive, 
with a cellular reaction. When you see that, you suspect a so-called cast nephropathy. And finally, what I mentioned before, you have to give an information uh, of tubular atrophy here in the neighborhood of a obsolescent of a completely sclerotic glomerulus. You see the entrophic tubules with thickened and partly multilayered tubular basement membranes and dedifferentiated epithelial cells. The interstitium, also examples of pathologic changes. On the upper left, you see a typical case of acute interstitial nephritis with predominant mononuclear infiltration. On the right side, also an acute interstitial nephritis with tubulitis, that means that inflammatory cells migrate in the tubular epithelium. In addition, you have here a small granuloma. That can be sarcoidosis, or it can be a granulomatous reaction, for example, when glomeruli are normal, granulomatous reaction in the drug-induced interstitial nephritis. Interstitial fibrosis is best seen on the trichrome stain, and you have to mention the extent of such fibrotic lesions in the biopsy report. And finally, this is a so-called COSA stain, and you see in the interstitium such deposition <coughs> of uh, um, calcinosis uh, of uh, such material. Finally, the example or examples of vessel changes. On the left side, an afferent, afferent material, which is markedly thickened. You see this homogeneous highland material. This is a advanced arteriolar hyalinosis, but what can be seen, for example, in cyclosporine toxicity, vascular types of cyclosporine toxicity, or in diabetes. On the right side, a small artery with smaller, swollen uh, endothelial cells completely obliterating the uh, vascular lumen. This is a typical alteration that is seen in the thrombotic microangiopathies. Simple arterial sclerosis, the thickening of the wall, and extracellular matrix material. And on the right side, a necrotizing arteritis with this reddish fibrinating necrosis uh, in the whole uh, vascular wall. I think this were, were examples for you what you can see in principle or in many instances in a renal biopsy uh, and which are important for diagnosis and pathological reports. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rüdiger, for this extensive um presentation also very condensed, of course, because nephropathology is much more than just 45 minutes, but you managed to put it in, into a nutshell, as we call it in English, and to give us an overview on how to um, manage, how to interpret, uh, and how to find the right diagnosis of a kidney biopsy to um, lead the patient to the right diagnosis and to hopefully to the right treatment. Any questions or comments from the audience? Uh, the chat is still open and stays open, so please feel free and let us know if you have any questions. If not, we, you can present your questions during the next presentation because it's not bothering us. Beautiful pictures, uh, one of the comments, so <clears throat> Rüdiger, you did an excellent job. Thank you so much.
you, you can present your question or comments during the presentation of the next two clinical cases. So I would suggest to proceed um, with the clinical case mm -hmm. and I ask you, you Weimler, to start with the first case. We uh, have chosen two cases from <clears throat> everyday nephrological uh, work. Um, these are um, cases you may see in nephrology practice uh, um, um, every week or every few weeks. And we've chosen both cases because they share some uh, uh, common things. So the first case presentation is a patient with nephrotic syndrome, um, which was a patient um, in his 40s. And he was transferred to our uh, department via the pulmonology <coughs> department. Um, this was a patient with uh, known cystic fibrosis. Um, and um, as in cystic fibrosis, uh, typical with recurrent bronchopulmonal infections um, in this past history. So um, the patient had a quite unspecific upper respiratory infection a few weeks before with uh, concomitant diarrhea. He had no fever and he reported that he had gained about eight kilograms um, um, in the last three to four weeks. Um, he developed peripheral edema, two plus to three plus, and the patient at this time um, was 183 centimeters and 105 kilograms. And at the initial presentation, he presented with a slightly elevated blood pressure of 140 over 90. At this point, when he presented, he had uh, almost normal kidney function with a creatinine of 0.08 and an uh, EGFR of 85.4 milliliters per minute, per minute. And at this point, he presented with uh, a nephrotic proteinuria of 11 gram per liter um, and no erythrocyturia at this time point. The ultrasound was uneventful um, and a patient with cystic fibrosis, he had no, uh, uh, no kidney stones at this moment. Um, we had uh, um, a typical uh, nephrology lab, which was inconspicuous. Uh, we are talking about so-called immunological world up with ANCA, ANA, uh, uh, DNA, electrophoresis, light chain diagnostics, and so on. And this was comple completely inconspicuous. Uh, um, he had a medication of pancreatic enzymes at this time point and uh, acetylcysteine um, as a cystic fibrosis patient with uh, regularly cholestine, uh, uh, nebulized cholestine as antibiotics. He had uh, no ibuprofen or Voltaren, and he had aspirin uh, because of the infection two days before, but just for uh, two times. Um, the patient had one medication at this time point I haven't noticed so far, um, which is a so-called CFTR modulator. Um, um, it's uh, called CAFTRIO in Germany and has three different um, um, types of modulators, which are called um, Ivacaftor, Tetzacaftor, and Elaxacaftor. But this is a medication with no known renal side effects. And just as a sidestep, um, um, uh, we have these cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulators. Um, these are modulators which are designed to correct the malfunction and protein, which is normally made by the CFTR gene. And we have different mutations um, with, coach, with which cause different defects in the protein. And we have four different medications with that specialized uh, uh, in modulating these single mutations. And the CFTR protein regulates the proper flow um, of water and chloride in and out of cells, lining the lungs and other organs. And this is uh, uh, the pathogenesis mechanism um, for cystic fibrosis and mutations then result in either a defective protein or no protein at all. And um, as you know, in cystic fibrosis, uh, there uh, is a buildup of thick, sticky muscles, which uh, then can lead to infections in the lungs and damage to the uh, pancreas. Um, but uh, as I told you before, um, there are no known renal side effects of these uh, very special medication. Um, so um, after uh, uh, having taken aspirin, we uh, took the patient one week later to our ward at this time point with a slightly elevated creatinine of 
and the EGFR of 70, and a high nephrotic proteinuria to kidney biopsy. This shows the whole renal biopsy on a, a trichrome stain. You see here the uh, capsule, fibrous tissue capsule, the cortex, and the corticomedullary junction, and uh, a little bit of the medulla. The biopsy contained, this is the PS reaction, the biopsy contained about 10 to 11 uh, clomeroli, so it was sufficient for diagnosis. At some higher magnification, you see that these clomeroli are normal cellular, there is no hypercellularity, tubules are intact, there is no interstitial inflammation, and as you will later see, there is no tubular atrophy here, uh, seen in the PS reaction. At high magnification of the clomeroli, you see that the clomeroli basement membranes are thin, there were no deposits, and there is no really proliferative or sclerosing lesions in this biopsy. Once again, Perhaps in some cases a very mild increase in extracellular mesangial matrix, but no hypercellularity, no mesangial cell increase. A almost normal clomolus on the right, and here you see an artery which shows no significant changes. Once again, such a clomolus, and on the right side here, an arterial, also completely normal without any alterations. On immunohistology, on the left side, you see IgG, completely negative. Some minor filaments or crumbles of IgM, and a positive IgM reaction in um, the hilar vessels. C1Q on the left lower side, also only a positive reaction in the arterial vessels, and this is also true for C3C. So we have no significant glomerular deposits of immunoglobulins or of complement factors. In such cases, we also use C4D because we can definitely exclude complement activation uh, via the classical pathway. You see the chromolus is completely negative, but you see the uh, C3 degradation product in these uh, arteriolar vessels at the chromolar halus. See within sections for electron prepared for electron microscopy and stained with toluidine blue also show normal glomeruli at higher magnification. When you do the next, you see that mesangial cells are recurrent, that the glomerular basement membranes are thin and not enlarged. On electron microscopy, we can see widespread loss of glomerular food processes in some areas as here, uh, uh, food processes are still present. In other areas, there is complete effacement of the food processes, for example, here in this area. There is no thickening of the glomerular basement membranes. There are no real irregularities. There are no deposits 
in the, the glomerular basement membranes and the adjacent mesangium. Once again, such a picture, the uh, effacement of food processes was about 70% here, intact food processes, and uh, on the other hand, uh, loss of food processes here on the, the lower capillary loops. So our diagnosis was a podocytopathy without any deposits, um, a so-called minimal change, columnopathy, because we had no proliferative or segmental lesions. However, with 10 glomeruli, the question always is, can we exclude focal segmental glomerulosclerosis? Because we had a sampling error and we had no lesion. And we mentioned this in our biopsy report. This is an old study of Medeo in the 90s of the last century made, who did morphometry uh, in patients in biopsies with glomerulosclerosis. And when you estimate that you have a kidney with about 10% of segmental glomerular lesions, that is here, yeah, and 90% of the glomerular are normal. And we go here up, you can see that when you have only 10 glomeruli, you have still a probability that focal segmental lesions or focal segmental glomerular sclerosis is not present in the renal biopsy. So it's always not certain when we do such the diagnosis of minimal change nephropathy, and we have to mention this in a report. I may start with a short question before I give you some more information about the uh, follow-up. If we don't have electron mic microscopy, what would, the, what would we call these pictures? Would we call them minimal change or...? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Because, well, there is, in principle, there is no difference. What we see uh, are podocyte changes with effacement of food processes. And in principle, there is no differences between cases of minimal change and focal segmental sclerosis, primary focal segmental sclerosis, with one exception, that in many cases with primary FSGS, the extent of effacement is larger than in minimal change. But with 70%, as in this case, we cannot differentiate it definitely from the glomeruli that uh, the podocyte changes belong to minimal change, or it may be uh, this very low and but certain percentage uh, segmental lesion in this case. But from the clinical point of view, my impression is I'm not sure if this is really just a feeling or whether it's on a scientific basis that in minimal change, the amount of protein. Proteinuria is mostly higher compared to focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. So in this case, uh, with 21 grams of proteinuria in 24 hours, um, and this histological lesion, I'm rather sure that this is a minimal change and not a focal segmental sclerosis. But that's simply my overview over the past. We, we did years. the diagnosis of minimal change, yeah. but we also mentioned that we cannot definitely exclude FSGS. Okay. Right. Okay. okay, so I, I will f uh, go further with a follow-up of this patient. Um, we had the diagnosis of minimal change nephropathy and we have chosen for a high dose oral corticosteroid therapy which means that in this patient uh, we started with uh, uh, methylprednisolone uh, 80 milligrams um, which is not one milligram per kilogram in this special patient because his weight was uh, much higher um, but um, um, after talking with the colleagues of the pulmonary department we decided not to go further uh, up um, 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 after uh, 80 milligrams um, per day. Um, at this time point, we also thought about tapering the steroids, maybe 
a little bit faster than in other patients because of the infectious risks, um, because this patient in the past already had uh, recurrent infectious problems, especially pulmonary infections because of his uh, uh, cystic fibrosis. Um, we had uh, a slight complication two weeks later. Um, the patient started um, with high dose steroids and had uh, uh, um, coronavirus infections two weeks, still under 80 milligrams uh, um, per day, but the uh, COVID infection was uh, quite uneventful for this patient. At this time point, he had slightly acute renal failure with a maximum creatinine of 1.8. Um, but if we look um, for the further follow-up of the patient for the next four to six months, um, we see that um, very early, and this is quite typical for a lot of cases with minimal change nephropathy, that only after one to two weeks um, the proteinuria was uh, uh, going down uh, quite fast. And um, after four weeks uh, with a high-dose steroid regimen, um, we had a nearly uh, complete um, um, re remission with this patient. Um, if we look at the follow-up of uh, minimal change nephropathy, we see that spontaneous remission without treatment um, um, is uh, not very often, so immunosuppressive therapy normally should not be withheld in an attempt to ident identify such patients because uh, such an approach um, um, would lead to uh, thrombotic and infectious hazards of uh, persistent nephrotic syndrome. So we have different definitions um, of the response to therapy in minimal change nephropathy. Um, in this patient, we had uh, almost complete remission, um, which is defined with a reduction in proteinuria to below 300 milligrams per day. And our patient over the last uh, month has proteinuria in an area of uh, between 150 and maximum of 300 milligrams per day. Um, most of the patients go to a complete remission. Um, and partial remission uh, or no remission is an unusual event in minimal change um, disease. But as we already heard uh, from Professor Walter, in these patients with only partial remission or no response, one can never be certain that such partial responders, responders do not actually have um, uh, maybe focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, uh, so-called FSGS. Um, we define patients who relapse, we, we define patients who frequently relapse, and we define patients who have glucocorticoid-dependent disease or glucocorticoid-resistance um, uh, disease. Um, as initial ter therapy, as I told you, um, um, most centers uh, worldwide prefer glucocorticoid monotherapy, and um, we can look for a complete remission in almost 80 to over 95% of adults um, with minimal change disease. And the initial dose um, with oral prednisolone typically is chosen uh, with one milligram per kilogram body weight or as an alternate day regimen with maybe uh, uh, minimized toxicity prednisolone at two milligram per kilogram every other day. And uh, most centers continue with the initial high dose for a minimum of uh, four weeks. This is what, you, what we did in this patient. And then we have to talk about tapering the uh, steroid uh, therapy. Normally, a slow tapering is performed to sustain the remission. Um, um, and a shorter tapering regimen is normally associated with an increase uh, of relapse of the disease. Um, we start tapering prednisone one to two weeks after complete remission, and then you may choose a regimen to reduce the daily prednisolone dose by 5 to 10 milligrams per week or per two weeks for a total period of approximately 16 to 20 weeks. And uh, this is what we did in this patient too, and we had no um, further complications um, with this uh, um, patient. Um, may I ask a question mm -hmm. concerning patients with steroid resistant mm -hmm. um, nephrotic syndrome mm -hmm. and the diagnosis of minimal change? What about genetic testing? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to look for other reasons. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, we have to look if there's a family history. That's uh, in, in some patients, um, there might be family history. Mm -hmm. 
um, um, genetic causes if the patient has um, minimal change disease in the childhood may be a topic. Um, for our patients at the adult uh, nephrology department, we have two time points where we see the patients. One is between 20 and 30, and one is uh, between 60 and 70 or 60 and 80. And even uh, especially in the younger patients, um, one might think about um, 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 genetic testing, especially in frequent relapses or in glucocorticoid resistant patients. And we may think about a second biopsy as Professor Walter told us, because uh, glucocorticoid resistant disease or dependent disease may be FSGS and not minimal change disease. Just a mm -hmm. simple yeah. sampling error yeah. in this mm -hmm. case. Maybe in, in no. this patient, I think we had 10 <coughs> glomeruli. 10 glomeruli. Yeah. And as we've seen in the picture, yes. this might be a 50% a chance of uh, So, well, there, there were further information from information from the renal biopsy that is not FSGS, you had no tubular atrophy, mm -hmm. no uh, interstitial fibrosis, uh, no vessel changes and things like that. Yeah. So yep. coming back to the biopsy, what would we expect in, in uh, cystic fibrosis when we have proteinuria? Um, I wouldn't expect a minimal change, I would rather expect post-infectious or whatever, isn't, isn't it? Well, um, that it's, uh, it's a rare, it's a rare. In my course. experience, there is no relationship between cystic mm -hmm. fibrosis yes. and idiopathic yeah. nephrotic syndrome. Uh, formerly, we have seen cases with typical post infectious yes. nephritis mm -hmm. and even amyloidosis. Exactly, yes. 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 But mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not aware of any studies that show a relationship mm -hmm. with such diseases. Yes, um, question your um, Many of these patients have a relapse. And, and, we, we, try, we give uh, cortisone. What's your, your idea? What should we change the therapy uh, of our immune suppressant? For example, so, or in, how, how we should treat with cortisone? Most recommendations tell us that for the first relapse, um, to start again um, with the steroid therapy, if the first steroid course um, um, came to complete remission. And then you have to look how often the patient has relapses. So we have the frequent relapses with uh, uh, um, um, frequent relapses per year. And we have the other patients, they come once a year, they come once every two years. Some of them have a few years without relapse and then come with another relapse. And um, we know that in these patients, in most of the cases, if they have um, answered to the first steroid pulse, um, they answer to the concomitant steroid therapy um, even after a few years. But you, you may have to talk with the patients and um, to have a look on the side effects. Would you recommend mm -hmm. to switch to cyclosporin um, with frequent relapses? If the patient, in if, especially in steroid dependence, in patients with frequent relapses and in steroid toxicity, mm -hmm. We can uh, um, think about uh, CNI therapy with, uh, for example, cyclosporin uh, uh, or tacrolimus. We and we have a, a few patients yes. who are really resistant to all these ter therapies. And then it's going to be difficult because we don't have studies. But we, even in these patients, can think about uh, um, um, more immunosuppression like cyclophosphamide, like rituximab. Okay. But we don't, we can't rely on studies. So we only have case reports. We know, for example, with rituximab, there are patients who go in remission under rituximab, um, but we don't have any any data about the long-term outcome for renal function in these patients. Okay. Um, I can't see any new questions in the chat, so maybe we'll proceed with the mm -hmm. second yeah. question. Just a, a last comment on these patients. And these patients had a, a pulmonary infection three, two weeks uh, before and just started with uh, proteinuria one week after this pulmonary infection. So maybe this might be a cause for, for, for this case because we have uh, some patients with minimal change disease which relapse in larger distances, so every one or two years, and they almost always relapse if they have a, a, a kind of infection. Mm -hmm.
Okay. So I go for the. Minutes left. Mm -hmm. for the yeah. Next stage. Um, we go for the second presentation, which is quite similar uh, from the first presentation. We have a female patient in her 30s, um, um, and as the first patients, she had all. She also had uh, nephrotic syndrome. So the, she was transferred via a, a nephrologist. Um, we had, uh, beside a Hashimoto thyroiditis, she had no known um, problems. And as in the first case, um, she reported about eight kilogram uh, weight gain in, in the last three to, uh, two to three weeks um, with uh, peripheral and orbital edema, peripheral edema with a three plus. Um, with a, a weight of 63 kilograms and 165 centimeters. Her blood pressure was normal at initial presentation. And the patient was not quite sure if there might have been a, a proteinuria when she had um, a urinary tract infection six months month earlier um, when she was seen by her general practitioner. At presentation, creatinine was normal with 0.6. And the, she had an EGFR of 125 uh, ml per minute. And uh, as the first patient, she had nephrotic proteinuria with 6.4 gram per liters. And uh, this patient has dysmorphic erythrocyturia. Ultrasound, uh, there were no uh, pathological signs. And as in the first patients, we had otherwise uh, uh, unconspicuous uh, nephrology lab. Um, she had no medication at this time, and uh, she was transferred for kidney biopsy. This shows the whole biopsy sample, uh, also cortex and uh, containing cortex and uh, medulla, and uh, some perirenal tissue at a trichrom stain. Similarly, you can see the capsule, and you can differentiate cortex and here the medulla. Uh, the hematoxylin eosin stain shows a number of glomeruli. Altogether, there were 15 glomeruli in this uh, biopsy. And if we go to higher magnification, this is the uh, HE stain, you see that these glomeruli are also normal cellular, but in contrast to the previous biopsy, we have some foci as you can see here, of tubular atrophy uh, with these dilated tubules and interstitial fibrosis. No significant interstitial inflammation. Let's go back to the glomeruli. Um, there are no more cellular, a little bit hypertrophied, but there are no significant changes um, at the basement membrane level. Also at higher magnification, normal cellular glomeruli, thin glomerular basement membranes, no evidence of uh, deposits. This shows the semi-thin sections where you can see the mesangial areas, the glomerular basement membranes, and this is the glomerular hilus with the macula densa and the so-called uh, gomatic cells. Foci of tubular atrophy, and uh, in contrast to the last patient, there is a tubular hyalinosis, as you can see here. In four to five glomeruli, depending on the section uh, plane, uh, we had additional lesions. Here's the glomerulus. It shows here an increase in PAS positive matrix and a loss of capillary lumina, and another lesion here with an adhesion to Bowman's capsule. And also this glomerulus shows 
a segmental lesion with an increase in extracellular matrix. At higher magnification, this is a trichrome stain, you see this typically segmental sclerosing lesion, the loss of capillary lumina, the increase of extracellular matrix, higher than material on the lower part here in this lesion, and the adhesion or the connection to Bowman's capsule. Another clomolus with a single lesion and capsular adhesion. And also here a segmental lesion in this part of the clomolus with an adhesion to Bowman's capsule and this foamy transformation of endothelial cells. And last clomolus with such a lesion. On immunohistology, IgA, IgG, this is an example of IgG, it was negative. And in the chromoli with segmental lesion, we have seen these confluent deposits of IgM, C1Q, and to a minor extent, C3C. On electron microscopy, we have seen widespread loss of glomerular food processes. There are no processes seen in most of, or mostly along these glomerular basement membranes. Only a few capillary loops, as you can see here, show these features. And there were in contrast to the last patient, severe podocyte changes with vacuolization and even uh, hyaline droplets within the cytoplasma of this podocyte. And fortunately, we had some or one typical segmental lesion, as you can see here. There is no podocyte uh, cell overlaying. Uh, this segmental lesion, there is a marked increase in uh, extracellular matrix and there is endothelial cell activation with some vacuolization here on the right side in the neighboring uh, capillary loop. So here we could do the diagnosis of focal segmental global sclerosis subtype NOS, that means not other specified. It's a, according to the clinical presentation, a primary FSGS. We had a clear cut podocytopathy and we have a clear cut nephrotic syndrome, so we can do the diagnosis of primary or idiopathic FSGS. Okay. Good. So um, I will give you a quick uh, follow-up for um, this patient. Um, we had the same we had the same decision as in the first patient. Um, we had the diagnosis of um, FSGS and started the patient on a high dose oral corticosteroid therapy. Uh, in this case, we started with uh, um, a methylprednisolone, one milligram per kilogram body weight, which was uh, about sixty milligram in this patient's. And we had the same question, um, how to taper the steroids. Um, um, we gave this patient um, um, to an outpatient nephrologist, and they started um, for at least eight weeks uh, with a high-dose um, steroid therapy. And they reached partial remission um, after eight weeks with uh, 1.2 gram per uh, 24 hours. And, and then um, 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 tapered the steroids to 40 milligrams and 30 milligrams per day. And they have seen that um, after three to four months um, with a high dose or a tapered high dose steroid regimen, the pr proteinuria didn't change. And then uh, we've seen the patient again after six months. And at this time point, um, uh, the colleagues had already switched the patient with uh, partial remission and the proteinuria about 1.5 grams per, uh, per day 
um, to the combination of cyclosporin and a low dose um, steroid regimen um, with a dose of uh, only four milligram um, per day. And um, this is um, the time point at the moment. And uh, they are continuing uh, for cyclosporin um, therapy. Thank you, Jörg. Just a quick question from the chat uh, concerning formalin uh, fixation and the use for electron microscopy or immune histology. I think you mentioned it already in your primary or your first presentation, but maybe you can give the colleague, Dr. Limani, a short uh, uh, feedback. Well, especially for electron microscopy, uh, from other hydra, formalin fixation is not an optimal fixative. But uh, when renal biopsies are immediately fixed, um, the fixation is good enough to do also electron microscopy. Uh, and also immunohistology, uh, but uh, well, as with other tissues and uh, problem and um, antibodies, um, optimal fixation time uh, should not exceed four to six hours. Okay. So it's in principle possible. I think we do it here in Heidelberg, and uh, the results are okay. I mean, the pictures you see, the slides, the slide readings are done with this particular technique, and it works out quite well. Um, for the immune histology as well as for the electron microscopy. So uh, I think now, uh, Rudiger, you have a few slides. No, you can, you can ask. You I just have a, okay. uh, yeah, please. To, to the audience, if you can please, because it would be very helpful for us, if you can put your, your first name and your family name, your profile, your nephrologist or pathologist in which your country are participating from, because that can help us for the next planning of the symposium to be better in information, maybe. Uh, maybe you can give the word for Dr. Godans or something. Uh, or I think that was there, one perhaps one some yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, all right. So, um, first of all, let me, let me thank you all for the excellent presentations, also for the people who uh, went with us through this um, evening biopsy conference. I hope you enjoyed it and um, we all learned a bit of it and at least from the, um, at least from the uh, chat I can see that there's some work and some interest going on. Thanks so much. Uh, before closing I would like to ask Dr. Godanzi to give us a few words, a summary maybe, just uh, few minutes or so, and uh, we are very happy that we have you um, in uh, Pristina, is that right, Pristina? Yes. And you are organizing everything very well, so I had a lot of uh, very good feedbacks from Neshat that you are closely in touch with him, and I think we'll um, have uh, further great uh, meetings in the future. So Dr. Godanzi, please. Yes, hello. Um, good afternoon to everybody, dear colleagues, dear professors, honored professors. Thank you uh, very much for uh, sharing with us this uh, advanced nephrology live stream. On behalf of Kosovo Nephrology Society, I would like to extend our gratitudes uh, toward Heidelberg Neuron Centrum, our patriot, Dr. Nejat Miftari, our host and huge supporter, Professor Martin Tsayer, Professor Walder, Dr. Bambler, and all of our colleagues on the other sides of the live stream. For the second time this year, this live stream event from near and Centrum Heidelberg through Kosovo Nephrologist Society is uh, gathering nephrologists, pathologists, radiologists, and other doctors from Eastern European countries, Balkan and Mediterranean region. A special hello to all colleagues from Albania, Croatia, Montenegro, Turkey, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Macedonia, Egypt, Greece, Italy, Syria, Ukraine, and so on. We are all very positive, and we do know that we will gain a lot from these interactive uh, lectures. It is that it is organized through Neuron Heidelberg. Eventually, 
on the future, they, there will be a, uh, space and methods to learn through exchange programs, joint symposia, etc. This afternoon did seem like a perfect time to listen and learn on the basics of nephropathology. And of course, when it comes from the best, uh, there's no better place to be. It is great to be a nephrologist and to be among nephrologists and peers. Once again, thankful for everyone attending this conference. Each of you made an effort to be here and the pleasure is all ours. I wish you all had a very productive conference. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for these kind words and thank you for all your work and efforts you put in uh, to organize this conference and we'll be certain we'll be back um, in the near future with a new conference. We are happy to understand what you are interested in, so maybe we can choose the right cases for you. We won't go into basic details in the future because we had this extensive lecture today. And also this lecture is recorded, so maybe for those who are interested, they can go back and uh, look uh, at home at their laptop or whatever uh, on this lecture, because it's important to understand the basics of nephropathology. Also, um, if everything goes okay, we never know what, what the future will bring us. We we'll, might have another trip to Kosovo next year, uh, together with uh, Neshat, of course, uh, Professor Walter, Dr. Weimler, and we've been there a couple of times. It were great times. We, had, we made a lot of friends. We had uh, good presentations, uh, good discussions with our colleagues. So I think we look in a bright future, at least when the uh, circumstances we cannot influence, I won't mention them now, uh, won't keep us away from this adventure in the next few in the near future. So thank you very much for this um, exchange and uh, stay healthy and we wish you a nice evening and maybe we'll see us shortly or soon again. Bye bye.